everybody, I'm Jen with Jen Vasquez Photography and today I am so excited for this Interviews with Experts series. Today we are talking with Ashley and Ashley is A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H. -I, -E I want to make sure because it's a unique spelling and I love it. She, love it. Uh, she's with I Do Boku and I'm going to put all the links down below. Um, she helps brides planning their wedding online in a simple way so that they can actually enjoy their wedding planning process because they're marrying their best friend. So she is going to come here today and talk with us. I'm going to ask her a little bit about her and her business, but today she's going to talk about with us post quarantine considerations in your wedding planning. And that's kind of where everyone's at right now with wedding planning. So welcome, Ashley. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me here. As Jen already knows, my enthusiasm for this right now is through the freaking roof. I'm just <laughs> freaking out. So, bye. <laughs> I feel like everyone that's um, watching or listening right now is going to really um, enjoy this information because it's really timely for this time in our country with everything going on. And she has some really great actionable items. Um, but let's go ahead and start at the beginning. Um, how did you start this crazy fun business? Okay, so it started in a really unconventional way. So I started out as a blogger and I'll give you a little bit of backstory of how I kind of came into this to uh, give you a little bit of an understanding of it. Um, so uh, I have to, uh, a history of some severe depression and anxiety. It was so bad that um, I spent six and a half, seven years trying to get on disability for it, you know, took 30 different psych meds at different times trying to get something that helped. I even went through 42 rounds of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, that shock treatment. So I definitely struggled. During that time, I found blogging and fortunately, really exciting news. I eventually did find a med medicine combination that worked for me. And I am now fully in remission from depression and anxiety. And it was life changing. You have no idea. So I was looking for a career where I didn't have to work a traditional job because there were still some limitations there, still having panic attacks on shift, that kind of thing. Blogging seemed like a really good way to go. So that's where I started. I was looking for what topic I wanted to get into. I kept getting drawn back and back to wedding planning. Kind of vetted it to see if it was like a viable thing to get into, and it was. And I was just like, I'm drawn to love, basically. <laughs> It is just the happiest freaking thing in the whole entire world. I just wanted so badly to be able to facilitate couples having their magical day in whatever way I could. And so I decided to start building my expertise in the wedding planning space and then eventually building a blog off of it. I didn't know that it was going to go beyond a blog at first until I started seeing how I could really help these people and truly take action to facilitate making this easier for them. And I'm taking it further. That is so, first of all, it's amazing that you are in remission and that you're feeling better. I know that the pandemic has really put a spotlight on people that were having some issues because the pandemic sort of made everything worse for everyone, mm -hmm. no matter where you were in that process, whether you lost a job or not. For brides in particular, having to postpone or reschedule or cancel, it's, it's just been really difficult. So I'm really happy for you on that front. Thank you. What's the most favorite part of your job? I'm new to the part of getting to hands-on help people. My favorite part so far, I've gotten to help people in a small way so far. I was doing market research interviews. I was talking to brides one-on-one, -on -one, brides-to-be, to find out, in their words, what their toughest challenges are, 
what their biggest fears are, what their biggest stressors are. I wanted to know what they really need so that when I go to help them, I'm actually helping them with what they need and not what I think they need. Because I was starting to have some ideas, but I didn't want to just totally go down the wrong path. And I have to be honest, it just lit up my day when a bride would have like even the smallest question that I they could walk away with like some insight on how to proceed or some comfort knowing they're not the only one like from my other conversations like it's just like the smallest taste of getting to help them move towards their goals and it's already lighting me up so I can tell that I'm just like so headed in the right direction. What would be a piece of general advice for I mean, we're going to go dive deep in post-quarantine stuff, but Uh it's a basic piece of advice that that brides tend to really love. There's one basic thing I can, basic advice I can think of that I get a lot of appreciation for. I don't know if they love it, but they appreciate it. (laughs) And that is when it comes to buying a wedding gown, You know, a lot of people will say, how soon is too soon? And I see a lot of brides saying, oh, there's no such thing as too soon. And I just have to be like, oh, but there actually can be. And I need to caution you so you don't accidentally make a mistake. If if you get it too soon, there's like a couple different things that you could possibly run into. One of them is a dress can only be taken in or let out a certain number of sizes. You don't wanna think that your weight's gonna fluctuate that much, but even if you do everything right, like there are medical conditions that you can suddenly have that you have no control over that can wreak havoc on your weight, or their medications can have a side effect that wreaks havoc on your weight, and you can end up having to buy a second wedding dress and then you're out all that money. Or another thing that happens that I've actually seen happen a lot already is brides will buy a dress early and then they'll see, they'll keep seeing more dresses, you know, maybe in their social media or things like that, maybe in the newsletters they get. And suddenly they have gown regret and they're totally eyeing another one. And I've totally seen people end up buying second dresses when there's nothing wrong with their first one because they just regretted it and they had to have the second one instead. I can totally identify with that. When I was getting married many, many years ago, 22 years, I got a wedding dress like you're supposed to typically about a year in advance. It came in and at that time I had just gained weight and I didn't know why, I didn't know what the deal was. And it was like a whole, like almost a whole size. And so they had to let the dress out. Well, between the time when they measured me and when they let the dress out, and then when I was going to see if it fit, I had been to the doctor, discovered I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm. They put me on um, medic- medicine and I started to lose that weight. So I paid, which most people don't understand. Alterations of a dress can sometimes be like around $500, depending on where you live in the country, depending on who's doing it for you, obviously. But that, that could be sometimes like I had to let it, let it out and then take it all right back in again. So, you know, not just buying a dress, but also having your dress fitted before your wedding. Like I did it like two, three months before and you're not supposed to do that. And I figured out why. <laughs> so I ended up spending almost a thousand dollars extra, which is really ridiculous. Mm. So that's great advice. Great advice. Okay. We are going to dive deep because I have other like intro questions that I'm not even going to bother to ask because we have such juicy details on post quarantine considerations in your wedding planning that I want to get started right away. So first things first, what are a couple basic guidelines that we can start with? Okay, so for starters, number one, I've got three for you. Number one, I'm going to recommend that you get out a piece of paper and a pen. There is a lot of actionable content in here. Um, there's a lot of questions I'm going to recommend you ask your vendor, vendors and your venue. And there's a lot of other things you may need to take action on. The next basic guideline is your state is going to be where you're going to want to start go to either your state's.gov site 
or just Google your state name plus wedding guidelines. So for me, I Googled Ohio wedding guidelines. And you're gonna find things like, for Ohio, receptions are not allowed to be held at a personal home. Right now, crowd sizes have to be limited to 300 maximum. When you see something like that, make sure to find out if it's not on the site. Ask your vendor if the 300 maximum or whatever the number maximum is, if that includes your vendors or if it's just the guest count. And I, I will add one more thing because I just did a wedding on Sunday. So in California, we are not able to have more than um, 25 people even outdoors for like masses. Um, inside, it's not open yet for inside the church for Santa Clara County. So for us in California, there's a bunch of different counties and like our state is looser, but the county is who rules what what the rules are. So my bride went to the county website to find out what wedding limits were. And here in California, in Morgan Hill, she was able to have 15 people at a private home outdoors. So it's different county by county as well, at least here in California. So I would add to take that a step further in the county you live in, because some counties are stricter than the state. That's really good to know, that's good information. And then the third basic guideline is as things open up more and more, um, I'm going to recommend to you that you continue to take advantage of the possibilities to have virtual meetings with your vendors. This maximizes both time for both of you guys and safety for both of you guys. Even though things are open back up, COVID hasn't just magically disappeared. And with things more open, things are less safe. So if you can have a virtual meeting, go ahead and take it. All right, next question. What do brides need to think about when it comes to their venue? All right, when it comes to your venue, there are five things. So we're gonna go buy them one by one. Perfect. First one. So venues, you're used to them trying to take their space and maximize how many people they can squeeze into that space so they can make the most money off of you, right? Well now, with them trying to be in compliance with the new regulations from COVID, they are now shifting to try and make people space out for social distancing. That is going to naturally mean less people, fewer people can fit in the spaces. How does this affect you? Well, venues max capacities are likely going to be shrinking. If you had a venue booked at max capacity or close to max capacity before the quarantine and you had to postpone, there's a possibility you may need to shorten your guest list if you want to keep the same venue moving forward. So this is one of those moments where I'm recommending that you check with your venue to be sure. But, um, I was reading one article that was talking about weddings of the future since COVID has happened. And they were saying that it's likely these social distancing policies are gonna last for a long time. A long time. And my bride this last weekend streamed them getting married and streamed their whole party. So other family and friends beyond that number 15 were able to be there and enjoy it. And, and she didn't have to pay for all of the food and everything for multiple people. So she ended up saving on her budget that way as well. Oh, that's a really good point. I do talk about the live streaming later, but I hadn't included the budget point. <laughs> so number two, when it comes to considerations for your venue, with your ceremony venue, you're gonna wanna check with them on how the seating layouts are changing. They may be required to consider them. And so the way this is likely going to play out is they'll seat guests with the six feet rules by the households they've arrived in. So the households can sit together, yes. but then six feet apart from other households. And so there's a couple creative layouts. If you have any say in the actual layout of the chairs, of your venue like if you are doing it at your home even some creative layouts you might want to think about is doing it maybe in a circular way this puts the couple in the center and then that really maximizes the space for getting the uh, guests laid out around 
the couple. Or another idea that's kind of similar is doing the half moon layout, which is just the half circle. The third way that you need to be considering things with your venue is similar. It's checking with your reception venue about the table layouts moving forward. Again, you'll want to check with your current state and county guidelines. So like in Ohio, there's a six foot distancing rule between tables right now. And they also have a rule that there's no congregating or milling about allowed. Yeah. So people are required to be seated at tables at all times. So this totally, this includes dancing. And also the bride and groom going table by table to do table visits and- Oh. I, we did, I would do pictures of that normally, and we can't do that anymore, so it is sad. Number four, considering about your venue. Now's the time to be more thoughtful than ever about your actual seating arrangements. Pay close attention to your guests that might be high risk. Thinking about your elderly grandparents, or friends that you know have an underlying health condition, and then be careful who you seat them by. So for example, you might have an elderly relative and you also have a friend that you know travels a lot for work. You'll wanna make sure that you don't place your elderly relative or any other high risk people by that friend. Yeah. So it's one more criterion to take into consideration while you're making your seating arrangements. And finally, the last one about the venues, as we kind of hinted at, dancing may or may not be possible depending on the state or county guidelines at the time of your wedding. One thing that I read in that article talking about the future of weddings is that they're working on, I don't know who they are, yeah. but they... <laughs> well, somewhere. <laughs> They're working on what they're calling satellite dance floors, where they can place multiple dance floors throughout the room so that it reduces the overcrowding on the dance floor. That's creative. So you might want to, I don't know if these are coming out already, but you could consider asking your venue if, if they've thought about that or if they've got that going on. Yeah, and I would imagine the venue in the county they're in, in order to be able to service, to serve customers, they have to follow all of the county guidelines, and which include the state guidelines, of course. And they'll, they'll really have the up-to-the-minute information because as a business, in order to make money, they're going to follow any and all guidelines to make it happen. So I think, you know, your first thing is to contact the venue, and I would highly recommend that. These are all things that you might not think about. I didn't even think about the dancing until my wedding on Sunday, that that's not even possible. It's just kind of crazy. 